Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to a new week of study. It's January 21st, and this is study number 121. So it's kind of interesting. But anyway, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for all that you do. We give our hearts to you and ask that you can use us. Um, we pray for this study and the time that we have together each morning. Uh, we ask for your spirit to speak to our hearts. And we ask for your care for our loved ones and those studying the truth and searching uh, for light. And we just pray, Lord, that the studies that we do here can play a part in those that are trying to uh, sift the precious from the wild. So we just ask again for your spirit to be here in our midst, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. And uh, so I, I didn't do all my homework that I'm supposed to do uh, for this uh, study. I had other things that I was doing. And um, so, so there are some things that we're going to have to take our time to go through. <clears throat> so we had sort of abandoned the end of uh, this, this section that ends with verse 22. That is, we're, we're reserving some, some of the interpretation there uh, for later. And we're going to come back to that. So we are going to come back to it. And then we started looking ahead. So one of the things that we see, and it was kind of interesting because I got in a discussion with, I um, can't think of the name, Patricia Cave, I think it is. There's there's this group of people, I don't know how how associated they are with this movement. Um, um, I don't think they were part of this movement. I'm not certain. Uh, they, they're, well, it's maybe not a nice way to say it, but Uriah Smith worshipers. So the idea is that uh, Uriah Smith pretty much is almost a prophet and uh, that his interpretation of Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45 in particular, is inspired of God, right? And they have, you know, some quotes of, from Ellen White where she talks about, um, you know, this presentation on the Eastern question by Uriah Smith and it encourages people and that it was a good study. We don't know what Uriah Smith said in that study. Um, so sometimes people just equate the Eastern question with um, a particular interpretation of Uriah Smith's on Daniel chapter 11, verse 40 to 45, but it's actually embraces a lot more than just those uh, verses. Um, and uh, uh, they, they put a, did a, a post talking about how um, the events in Daniel chapter 11 have to occur before the close of probation in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Right. So this is kind of this, this argument that, you know, you can't have, you know, all of those things happening in chapter 11 leading up to the end of the papacy and so forth. And then chapter 12, verse one, going back because it needs to follow chronologically. But one of the things we see is in the book of Daniel is there's repeats and enlarge. It's not just completely chronological all the way from chapter 11 all the way through that everything happens and follows one after the other. Right. And of course we can see that here with these verses where um, obviously Daniel 11 verse 22, Uriah Smith and us are going to place that as the crucifixion of Christ in 31 AD. But then we're going to go in verse 23 back to the Jewish league. Right. So that is, we, we don't expect the Daniel chapter 11, that all of the events are going to just follow one after the other. There are things that occur that help us to understand why something is being mentioned when it is, right? So one of the things that we uh, we had uh, noticed that I don't know if anybody else ever noticed this or anybody else ever had this interpretation, but when we go back to uh, But a Prince, shall cause the reproach to cease, that we believe that this is actually referring to the cross, something that's going to happen much later, and it's going to be mentioned in the time of Julius Caesar. And 
uh, we can see then if we we understand um, these verses that this is going to be, of course, Julius Caesar, um, Augustus, and then Tiberius, and then we're going to have the crucifixion of Christ. We can kind of see why that is set up, right? So there's a way of looking at Daniel chapter 11 that we have that I think, you know, is quite profound that we noticed these details. Um, and I, and I think it gives an answer to why we get to the crucifixion of Christ here, that there is this grouping. Once you, you're in the time of Julius Caesar, this grouping of this transition from Caesar to Augustus to Tiberius to get us to the crucifixion of Christ. So in a sense, it's a thematic grouping within this prophecy. So when we go back to, um, to the Jewish, Jewish league, uh, that there is a reason why we're now starting with the Jewish league, why we're going back there, because there's something thematic that's happening in these verses. And does that make sense to people? So there's a yes there. So, so this idea, I think, really helps us in our understanding of Daniel chapter 11. And, and we have been doing that, not, not, we haven't explicitly stated that, but, you know, we can see where it's going to address Persia, right? Uh, and then it's going to address Greece. And we could see that there was some groupings of, of things that, that, that made sense thematically. So now if we go back to the Jewish league, um, this is going to lend, lead us to what event in, in, in verses 23 and 24? Where, where is it going to bring us to? Cause it's going to go back. To, so it says this after the league, that's the Jewish league in 161 to 168 BC made with him, that's pagan Rome. So that's the, the Jews making this league with pagan Rome. He shall work deceitfully and uh, use the league for furthering Rome's interest in the eastern regions. That's what it says in Swearingen's. For he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. He shall enter peaceably upon the fattest places of the province. And he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. Now here we have... Uh, Titus's destruction of Jerusalem, 70 AD. So the question is, is that uh, correct interpretation of what that's talking about? He shall scatter them among the prey and spoil and riches. That's the dispersion of the Jewish people after the destruction of Jerusalem. Yea, and shall forecast his devices against the strongholds, even for a time. Right? So this is going to take us from the Jewish league up to the destruction of Jerusalem and after. And then it's going to talk about this period from 31 BC to 330 AD, right? That's the time. And then it's going to go back. He, pagan Rome, Octavian, the king of the north, shall stir up his power and courage against the king of the south, right? So it's going to go back to the Battle of Actium. So, so does this make sense then, that we're going to talk about the Jewish League bringing us up to the destruction of Jerusalem and the persecution that follows? Does that make sense to people? And then we're going to go back again and address the Battle of Actium that begins this period of 360 years. Yeah, I'm not sure about the um, interpretation concerning the Father's Fathers that's relating to uh, the destruction of Jerusalem. Okay. So w- what problem would you have with that? I mean, it's definitely well, a different interpretation than, than Smith. Well, yeah, I'm just uh, something about it. I've just not settled into it. Okay. Now, so we have him scattering among the, among them the prey, the spoil, the riches. Now, the idea in Uriah Smith is that this is, this has to do with how the Romans conquered people, right? That is, they're going to share the spoil with these newly um, conquered uh, provinces. That That's the idea that's in Uriah Smith. So, so why did we take this and uh, connect this to uh, the scattering of, of of this prey and the spoil, the riches, dealing with the dispersion of the Jewish people after the destruction of Jerusalem? So this is what we looked at last time. So why why did we come to this conclusion? What was sort of the key? And I mean, this may be a wrong interpretation, but how we were looking at it. <clears throat> 
is this is going to be the, the way that we're understanding this is this is Rome's persecution of, of both the Jews and also the Christians uh, that are going to happen from Rome until 330 AD when it's going to be uh, transferred over to Constantinople. So, um, all right. I have a, I have an odd question mm-hmm. for what we're, what we've been looking at here with, uh, with verse 23. Okay. Now, we placed the league as occurring from 161 to 158 BC. Yeah. The translators of the Bible were placing that league in 171 BC. Yeah, which is wrong. Okay, now why is it wrong? Because there was no league in 171 BC. There was a league that Rome decided to abandon in 171 BC. Uh, based on? Based, as I'm, as I'm looking at my history at the moment, um, we have people that had sought a league with Rome and the Romans declared war on Macedonia at that time beginning the third Macedonian war. Oh, so not a league with the Jews. No. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so after the third Macedonian, yeah, they're, they're, they're not correct though. They're not, that's not what's being talked about here. Okay. Cause I, all I was doing is I was looking at this. I mean, I don't agree that Smith would have been a prophet and I'm trying to make sense of some of the things that we've read out of swearing gin as well. Yeah. No, and and um yeah, I mean obviously Smith isn't a prophet, everything isn't isn't uh uh correct. Um so um I'm just reading a little bit here. Um so I guess the, the thing that, that I was looking at was that by one seventy BC you have Antiochus again deciding to do war with Ptolemy in Egypt. And then the Romans begin to step in after that. Yeah, but see that, that doesn't fit. I don't think. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm not understanding what you're saying. I mean, we have to take this league as being the Roman league. I mean, one is it's on the charts. Take it as the Roman league or the Jewish league? Well, the Jewish Roman league, right? Okay. Right. So you have the Jewish Roman league. That's going to be 161 to 158 BC. And now Stephen's done some work on that and he, he does have a, a new chart sort of trying to explain uh, how these things happen and, and why we have 158 BC. I, I don't know if we need to look into that in detail right now, but I mean, I accept it as a given, right? It's just we have this league in 158 BC and we have a leak in 161. That's connected to that league in 158. So there's just too much evidence to sort of um, set that aside. And, and we have done studies on it already. Why we we accept that now? Whether we we know all the reasonings behind it. Um, to me, it's something that was given to Miller as much as the other dates, and the 666 years seems very solid as a symbol. Okay, now, one other question. Yeah. We have agreed that we have two dates on the 1843 chart, one of which does not have a a biblical foundation, and that's 164. Yet, on the 1850 chart, the, the difference becomes, instead of 164, they chose 168. Now, now, what's that 164 again? Isn't that just about something about anti, um, Antiochus Epiphanes? Right. And, um, and what's the date? Why do they have 164 and 168 for the same event? No. <clears throat> they, they set aside 164 on the 1850 chart and they put 168 as being when Rome conquered the first division of Greece. Okay. So when we're looking at both of the charts, there is just a little bit of reference 
as to why we we may need to consider a little different time period. I mean, I agree. We're looking at this <clears throat> as to when Rome is entering into league with Jerusalem. But <clears throat> wouldn't 168 be the first of the three geographic areas that Rome has to conquer? Well, we normally say one uh, <clears throat> uh, 65. Right. BC for the first one, and then 63 for the Glorious Land, and then 31. AD. Now, it's 164 wasn't added to, to the 1850 chart. <clears throat> so one, 164 was really what Miller was having. It was a question that applied to Miller. They were saying that Antiochus Epiphanes stood up against the Prince of Princes. So that was something pertaining to that time that he had to deal with. And right. he had to start just to sort of meet all them accusations. But by the time 1850 came around, it wasn't really much of a, an issue in the discussion. So I would say that that was why I, well, that was left out of the 1850 chart. Yeah. Okay. So I don't fully understand this, this 164. So, um, so what's the problem with the 164 date on the chart? I'm not saying that there is a problem with the 164 date on the chart because it's recording the year which they understood was the death of Antiochus Epiphanes, who, of course, stood not up against the Prince of Princes. Yeah. And so you're saying, is that date correct or not? Well, no, I'm not saying I'm not asking the question whether it is correct or not. I'm just noting that that is a date that does not have any biblical foundation. I agree with Steve. I would see what you're saying. You're just saying, yeah, because that's the date of Antiochus Epiphanes, 164 BC. Now you're saying it doesn't have a biblical foundation and that it's not part of these prophecies. Correct. Okay. And, and, and the reason why they're placing it there, because they're, they're trying to show that Jesus' words regarding the abomination of desolation and all that kind of stuff uh, couldn't be referring to future events if if it happened under a Antiochus Epiphanes. Correct. So he's not. Okay. Okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah. So it's just not an issue then. They, they don't need it on the 1850 chart. The 168 BC date isn't relating to that at all. Right. It's not like they changed the date. I'm not saying that they did change that. Okay, yeah, but yeah, but I I know. I just I'm just clarifying it. So you brought that up for what reason? Like I don't follow the reason of bringing it up. Just about the 158, you're saying that we have to reconsider that? I'm I'm not saying that we have to reconsider it. I'm saying we we've always looked at these these time periods where they have a beginning and they have an ending. Just like when the 2300 day prophecy was being considered we were looking at its beginning in 457 bc in the fall of that year okay and the ending of that 490 years occurring in the fall of 34 bc ad ad excuse me yeah and then we have the 1,764 years after 34 to 1798. Yeah. To 1798. So we have a beginning and we have an ending. So my question was, with the one, the the 168 BC that's noted on the 1850 chart, if that is a beginning regarding the the conquering of the three geographical territories to denote okay. Rome's superiority and then we would come to an ending date okay um and and what period would that be like what period of time when would it end well could it end in 158 oh you're saying the like the 10 years right with the jewish league Okay, Stephen, and you were saying that well, those aren't the dates. We don't use 168 for conquering the three geological. Uh, geographical. Geographical, yeah. Geographical. Mm -hmm. 
So you normally apply to 65. Okay. Um, when Pompeii conquers uh, Syria. So you're normally using 65 when Pompey conquers Syria. All right. Yes. Um, now, why do they have 168 BC? That's for um, what is it that they're marking there? The Battle of Pydna? Yes. Now, the Battle of Pydna, that's also um, June 22nd, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Which, which is an interesting symbol that, I mean, they have that there because that June 22nd date uh, relates to, of course, the Battle of, um, the Battle of Raphia that's also on June 22nd in 217 BC. Right. Yeah. So you 49 years difference. Right. There's 49 years difference. Well, that's, that's really interesting. Yeah. I know. <laughs> it's, it's something we, we, we've noted before. Um, and I've never figured out what to do with it, though, right? Now, so with the Battle of Pydna, what role does that play then in, because it's, you know, the, the connected, I guess, what, with the Third Macedonian War or something? Yeah. So it saw the further ascendancy of Rome in the Hellenistic world and the end of the Antigonid line of kings, whose power traced back to Alexander the Great. So I would think that that is significant. That's something that we need to consider a bit more, like its prophetic significance. Now, now it's not particularly mentioned here in Daniel chapter 11 that we know of, right? Agreed. But if we think about the Battle of Raphia is definitely mentioned. Um, how would we connect it? You know, obviously we have the 49 years and they're both June 22nd. Uh, they're both connected with a, uh, if I remember correctly, um, in, so I'm just going to look here. Um, so when we, when we look at these, um, in June 22nd, um, 217 BC, right, you're going to have this connected with a, a lunar eclipse. And, and same with the Battle of Pydna, if I'm, um, I think there's, uh, with the Battle of, of Raphia, there's going to be eclipse right after the battle. And then, uh, with the Battle of Pydna, uh, there's actually going to be an eclipse, uh, a lunar eclipse during that battle or, or that night. It's going to happen at, uh, just, just a, a little bit after sunset on the 21st, so the beginning of the 22nd, something like that. Um, but anyway, it's noted. So maybe it's the night before or something that they noticed this lunar eclipse. I can't remember the details in the Battle of Pydna. But so they're, they're at the same time of year, same date. They have lunar eclipse associated with them, and um, they're 49 years apart. So, so what does that tell us? Does it tell us anything? Even though we don't have the Battle of Pydna directly uh, mentioned in Daniel chapter 11. Okay, well, yeah, we have a Jubilee cycle. That's the 49 years. So we have that symbol. We have the symbol, which is a symbol for FFA. So what do we do with this Pydna then just as a symbol? How does it? Okay, so uh, here's a commentary on uh, Daniel 11. Um talking about none shall stand before him. Um, I'm not sure which part that is. So this is going to be, um, let me see here. So this is, this is earlier. So they're going to mention this earlier, uh, not here in these verses, but earlier on. Um, so Rome, Rome conquers Syria. I'm just reading here. Um, so, which verse are they referring to? Mm -hmm. Any thoughts about Pydna here? I mean, this, this obviously plays a part in history. Right. But they're going to take this back to, the, this commentary does, dealing with uh, verse 16. In that he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him. He shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. And so... In that, they're just going to use in this commentary, it's Damsteed actually, um, 
that he's just going to go over some of these wars and he's going to start uh, with Pydna, right? So Rome ends Syria's power in the south during the reign of Antiochus IV Epiphanes. The Sixth Syrian War was fought 170 to 168 BC. Egypt was invaded several times. A large spoil was carried to Syria when Antiochus again entered Egypt. A Roman mission met the king and at once uh, put an end to the Seleucid power in Egypt. Uh, Polybius, or how do we say his name, described this historic encounter showing the extent of Rome's superiority at that time. And I'm just reading through here. This is the one where he uh, draws a circle around Antiochus with a stick in the sand. So it says here in his summation of this, it is clear that by 168 BC, the Roman king, kingdom dominated the civilized world, having limited the Seleucid kingdom on the side of the Ptolemaic dynasty in the south, as well as on the side of Asia Minor in the west. So what do we do with this? This, um, this 168. So that's basically the idea on the 1850 chart, right? I would think so. So what does it say, say exactly on the 1850 chart? Do, do you get the wording there? Rome conquered the first division of Greece, 168 B.C. Stephen, what do you think about that as far as does that make sense then in the context of the Battle of Pydna? Do I agree with what? What the 1850 chart says? Huh? What's that? What the 1850 chart says? Well... There was other battles then after that, and I think before it as well, that Macedon, Macedonians mm-hmm. lost. I think yeah. Rome didn't actually incorporate part of Macedonia's territory as in part of the Roman Empire until after that. Mm-hmm. Um, there's maybe like a, a different area, but like kind of, they had a lot of influence over it. And then it took us some time before they actually incorporated it into the yeah. empire. Yeah, it's always a very difficult thing when something happen, gra- happens gradually over a period of time, you know, to say, well, what event do we actually mark? You know, for instance, the fall of the Ottoman Empire, August 11th, 1840. Well, you know, the person, a secular person could say, well, it didn't, you know, the Ottoman Sultan didn't really fall until, you know, the 1920s, right? You know, so, so this always becomes a difficulty. But we have it on the 1850 chart. And, and so we have to give some weight to it to try to understand what this is referring to, why this would be there. I think that's the point that Dwight is kind of making. And Pidna does have these symbols attached to it. You know, June 22nd, a, a, ju- a jubilee cycle. Is, uh, is 168 on the charts? Yes, it's on the 1850 chart. I gotta go back and look at it. I looked at it a minute ago and I didn't see it. So, if you if you look where you find the cross on the 1850 chart, look directly above that. You will find both 168 and 158. Okay, got both those dates. Yeah, because I just looked at the chart. Um, just let me see here. Let's keep, just to show people here, uh, it's not a good one. Trying to find the best picture of the 1850 chart. So, um, there's a diagram I've done a study of Daniel chapter two. And, okay. Uh, it's even more sort of trying to get a date for, cause you, you have like Babylon fall. You can normally say that it's taken over from 539 with Cyrus. And then, so you basically like one date, basically you can sort of say Babylon ends and, and Middle Persia begins. And uh, you have the Battle of, of Guagamela, where Alexander defeats Darius III. Yeah. You can maybe get the one date there as well, where Medo Persia is conquered by Greece in 331. Now the chart says 332. <clears throat> uh, but I think the, the Battle of Guagamela is, I think most, most historians put it in 331, so I'm not sure. Um, I just went with what I didn't really look into it in too much detail. And then you have really 183 years later where uh, the Macedonian aspect of Greece 
uh, becomes the Roman providence. So you, you have actually two battles of Pydna. You've had one there in 168, and then there was yeah. one in 28, 28 years, sorry, 20 years later in 148 BC. Okay. Where Macedonia becomes a, a Roman province. And then mm-hmm. in 146 BC, we have a battle of Corinth, where the great peninsula becomes a Roman province. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that would be uh, Peloponnese area of, of uh, Greece, and then mm-hmm. and then you have uh, another 267 years to when Rome conquers Syria. Now, I think I think uh, Uriah Smith six, says 65 BC, but I think other online would say 64 BC. And then that's what would be the Seleucid aspect of Greece. And then yeah. the Ptolemic aspect uh, continues until 31 BC, and that would be the end of Greece. So unlike Medo-Persia and Babylon, when uh, the end of Greece is very kind of um, gradual, it's hard to yeah. say. Very scattered. scattered. Very scattered. Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, when it comes to picking dates then for the something like that, well, you have to say, well, which date matters the most? Um, mm-hmm. Well, I was going to ask the question, and I probably should know this already, but why did they leave it off to 1843 and then put it on the 1850? They didn't leave it off the 1843 chart. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a part of a discussion at that time. Okay. All right. <clears throat> All right. So it's this something a, they're just discussing in 1850. They're putting it on the chart because they see significance at that time. But when they made the 1843 chart, they weren't they weren't looking at that. Okay. I put that diagram in your uh, WhatsApp. Uh, you know, yeah. I sent out to. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I just uh, shared this here just so people can see what's on the 1850 chart. And um, then... Well, this is just a side note, but you take that 168 and you times it by and times it by 23, and you see what it... Oh, well, that's the other thing we have to know, is that 168 is already a symbol uh, that we have in regarding it's the number of hours in a week. Right. right, and and so we, we we've had 168 as as part of that. So so that's the thing. This 168 becomes it's, it's a symbol on the 1850 chart, right? It has within it the June 22nd date. It has connection then because of that date to the Battle of Raphia 49 years afterwards. And and so I don't think you know we would we wouldn't say well 168 isn't significant. Now, so this chart, can you explain this, uh, Stephen, exactly what, what what this chart is? So this is the Daniel 2 timeline. <clears throat> That's a bit blurry. Like I, didn't, I just sent the one off. That's okay. We, I can read it on my, my little laptop, it, but it is a bit blurry. I was trying to look for a better one. <laughs> yeah, so I was just trying to get sort of like a timeline, just for how long particular kingdoms reigned. So Babylon, 70 years, Medo Persia, 208. And then just sort of uh, the longest there you can maybe put for Greece, it's about 300 years. For, for Ptolemaic. So that's yes. uh, that's going to be obviously Egypt. Yes. And that's going to be the, the 146 to the 31 BC, um, is that, yes. uh-huh. that's more, that's, that's less than 300. So where's the 300 from? Just going well, back. Well, that's from, from the Guatemala of Guatemala. Okay. Yeah. So it's including that, uh, 183 plus the one, um, 170, 76 or something. Yeah. All the, all the Greeks going back to that time. 331. Yeah. Yeah. So it's 330. Okay. I see. Yeah. So 331. 
Okay, I see. Yeah, that's more than 183 years. There. Yeah, so 331 to 31 BC. So that's going to be the 300 years. I see. Okay. Um, yeah, so there's these different different parts. You have Macedonia. Um, now, the Battle of Pydna, Macedonia becomes a, a Roman province in 148. So that's the Battle of Pydna in 148. Um, mm-hmm. So you don't have the Battle of Pydna in 168 on here. And that's going to deal more with Macedonia, right? So I think the, the original Battle of Macedonia, Macedonia then became like a, a servant state. But it wasn't a Roman province. Right, in 168, you're saying that becomes... Yes. So it took another 20 years and another battle of Pydna before yeah. it was fully incorporated. Yeah, so this is really a useful analysis to try to understand, um, you know, what we're, what we're addressing here. Because we have this transition from Greece to Rome. It's, it's definitely much more... Uh, doesn't happen suddenly. It's it's a gradual. It's much more gradual. Um, but we would put the Battle of Pydna there as a significant event, right? Well, yeah, it is a, an event that leads to Rome's domination, right? In the world stage, and and that's uh, Damstead's sort of argument with 168. Now, I'm not sure why he's, you know, whether he's thinking about the 1850 chart when he's talking about the Battle of Pydna, that it's important and he's trying to support it or anything. Um, he's just marking it as this battle where Rome now is definitely dominating uh, the Mediterranean area. Right? That, that it, it begins its domination there. Well, but, how does that impact? The, the, the sort of impact it has with uh, the Maccabees it sort of sees Rome as being sort of like a potential help to them. Right, yeah, because obviously it's around the time of, of Judas Maccabeus, right? So that's obviously there. So it becomes a help to the Jews, you're saying, with Rome uh, winning that battle. Well, of certainly a perceived help. It's sort of, uh, they've been fighting with uh, Greece for so many decades or whatever, and it's a kind of a, an opportunity to. Yeah. They've heard of it this year, power that they're not maybe as as oppressing. As and, and would, yeah, and so it would then lead to the league with Rome. I mean, because the reason you're having a league with Rome in the first place is Rome is now the dominating power in that area, right? Yes. Yeah. So basically, sort of um, their enemy, Rome's enemy is their enemy, sort of thing. So yeah. they have that thing in common. Yeah. Okay. So so this is starting to make a bit more sense. So we can see the role of the Battle of Pydna, um, and we can see that it's, I mean, it's part of a progression of, of events that happen. And, you know, it's obviously not something we're all really familiar with. I mean, we know, we, we, at least I know personally, I have like a sketchy understanding of this history. I mean, I know about some of the battles um, and some of the dates, but really what's, what's all this history, like putting it all together in a cohesive picture in my mind, I don't have. But this, this definitely does help uh, towards that end, right? You know, I'm not, I'm not an expert on, on this history. Um, so, so we can see then that um, we have this Battle of Pydna, and, and we're going to, as we go through and we start to draw these lines out, we're going to take into account all of this history. Now, we know that some of the history is not specifically mentioned in the scriptures. Right? So we don't have, in Daniel chapter 11, a mention of the Battle of Pydna right? that, that I know of. At least I don't see a reference to it. I don't see anybody saying, yeah, here we're going to interpret this as the Battle of Pydna. But it is uh, that none shall stand before him, the idea that Rome is going to be conquering this area, right? And we can see that this is going to happen in this progressive way. Now, 
The battle that's going to be mentioned more specifically is what happens in 31 AD with the conquering of um, the Ptolemaic Empire, Egypt. Um, we also have, like, this chart here doesn't have, you know, the Battle of Raphia or Paneum, but those are more in relationship to what's happening um, within Greece itself, right? Is that how we understand that? So it's not, it would be on this chart because it's not really connected to to that. That has to do with the king of the north, um, um, um I mean, how would we describe the Battle of Rafi? We have the King of the North and the King of the South. It's a battle between... The ascendancy of the King of the North. Right, yeah. So the ascendancy of the King of the North over the King of the South. Right. Because Greece, all through this time, is is in a civil war. Right? King of the North and the King of the South are battling it out. And then, so then we that's why we have Rafi and Paneum in that context. So... It's going to take us a little bit, a little bit of time to get this all sorted out. How we we see these different battles and where we place them. But I mean, I have with the 168 BC, just all of the symbols associated with it, um, and especially the one you know that we, we we have to consider right now because 168 has been showing up uh, quite a bit in our studies over the last year. Right. So um, it, it becomes a symbol in the Hebrew numbers. It becomes a symbol um, dealing with the weak. Um, it becomes a symbol connected with uh, different spans of time that are divisible by 168, such as the 2688. Um, and so so I, I, I don't think we've we've yet framed the significance of the Battle of Pydna in the context of our present message of, of what God is showing us now. So I think that's one of the things that we're going to have to to address here. I'm not sure how it's going to come about, um, but obviously we're going to have to look at that. Okay, so so I think that, that was profitable. That uh, wouldn't call it a diversion, but uh, looking at at that that date, 168 BC, and that it's going to be 10 years before 158 BC, and that it's on the 1850 chart. We also have to consider that symbol, right? And and what is that symbol? The 10 years. 15th day of the eighth month. I'm oh, sorry. Sorry, I thought you I thought you thought it was five yet. The 10 years is a symbol. The 10 years is a symbol. Anybody know? This goes back uh, to 2018. Oh, with Tess? Yes, right? So she did a study on October um, October 3rd, 2018. She did two studies. One was called 10 Years, and the other one was called The Midnight Cry. And 10 days later was October 13th, in which we mark as The Midnight Cry. So 10 years has been a symbol. Jeff has used 10 years as a symbol. Well, you have the, the Feast of Trumpets being 10 days, but that was sort of typifying William Miller's ordination until 1843. You have 10 years, 1833 to 1843. Yeah. No, so there's lots of places we have these these 10 years and 10 days. So, so it... it <clears throat> So it, it's obviously another symbol attached to this that we, we would have to consider. There, there's lots of connections that uh, we're going to have to explore. So, so I think it's significant. I think the 168 BC date is significant. Now, as far as the geographical locations, um, doesn't mean we abandon those, right? Because um, I think those are, are sound. But we, we recognize that that there are different events or different themes that are being addressed. So when we go back to this, this passage, so it's going to be in, in Swearingen, right, that he's going to say this, so I'm going to go over here, we're going to look at what he says. So his ideas are a little bit different than what you would see in Uriah Smith. 
So he says, in this specific chapter, we will continue the second part of our examination of the career of pagan Rome as outlined in Daniel 11, 23 to 28. Now, there are a variety of interpretations on this specific passage, yet regardless of what conclusions one may draw, we should realize that this passage is a definite description from pagan Roman history, and irrespective of what specific historical events in pagan Roman history one ascribes to this passage, it will not affect the overall prophetic chronology of Daniel 11. We will discover that verse 31 describes a transition to the history of papal Roman Empire, thus maintaining consistency with the earlier chapters of Daniel, right, which we would accept. Now, I personally believe that verses 23 to 28 offer a survey of three general historical trends in the history of pagan Rome as the new king of the north, the history of the Judean Roman League, so that's verse 23, the Roman subjugation of Syria, Judea, and Egypt, which would include the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, and the resumption of the warfare between the king of the north, pagan Rome, and the king of the south, Egypt, in two different conflicts, Caesar versus Pompey and Octavian versus versus Anthony. So, so here he's going to, and, and we can see the significance of this, right? So this Judea, the, the Roman Jewish League, whatever you want to call it, um, it has a specific history. Um, we have this history of Rome subjugating this these areas, Syria, Judea, and Egypt, right? So these three geographical locations. And then we have the king of the north, pagan Rome, and the king of the south, Egypt, in these conflicts, right? So the king of the north has a an application in this history, just as we see later in uh, Daniel 11, verse 40, right? And, but there you're going to have it with papal Rome, okay? So, so these become significant ideas. <clears throat> so then he goes on to look at, at verse 23. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. So he goes on, after the league made with him, he just quotes it. Having ended verse 22 with the crucifixion of Christ under the reign of the vile Tiberius Caesar, verse 23 shows a shift to a time when the Jewish nation would enter into an alliance or league with pagan Rome. This Jewish Roman league was first initiated by Judas Maccabeus, uh, who had appealed to Rome for assistance during the Jewish struggle against the forced Hellenization of Judea by Seleucid Syria oppressors in 161 BC. He had hoped that Roman assistance would intimidate the Seleucid dynasty to free its grip on Judea and help the Jewish people to eventually establish an independent nation that would be completely free of all foreign control. Uh, the Seleucid oppression of Judea would reach its climax under the era of the Syrian king Antiochus IV Epiphanes, still fuming from his expulsion from Egypt under the threat of, the Ro of Roman military force in 168 BC. Uh, Antiochus IV invaded Judah and plundered Jerusalem on his way back to Syria. Okay, so this is going to be in 168 BC that we're going to have that occurring as well, right? Through his strict policy of forced Hellenism, the forceful conversion of conquered peoples to Greek culture, that's an example, um, Antiochus uh, IV designed the total eradication of Judaism altogether. He promptly banned all Jewish religious services and dedicated the Temple of Jerusalem to the Greek god Zeus. The blatant act of desecration coupled with the burden of foreign occupation gave birth to a Jewish nationalist movement under the leadership of Judas Maccabeus, whose family, the Hasmonean family, had fled the city of Jerusalem during the initial invasion of Antiochus IV. Now, so in 167 BC, um, and, and I'm doing some studying on this right now. So uh, mostly because I'm discussing with somebody uh, who has weird ideas about um, the application of the, the Enoch calendar to these dates. So, so you're going to have 167 BC. You're going to have 
um, and then later on, uh, events are going to happen in 164 BC dealing with Antiochus Epiphanes. So here, Swearingen, he, he has a bit more emphasis on this, these events. He does place some of the interpretation of Daniel 11 as being filled by Antiochus Epiphanes, which we do not. But anyway, let's go on. And believing that God had raised up Judas as their deliverer, Jewish nationalists rallied to support him as he organized the many fractured, scattered communities, still faithful to Judaism, into a powerful nationalistic guerrilla army. He would launch several raids against Syrian positions and areas of Hellenized Jews that had conspired with the enemy. And later on, or later won, the battles of both of Emmaus in 166 BC and Mizpah in 165 BC. So decisively that Jerusalem fell back under Jewish control without any resistance whatsoever. Judas promptly ordered that the city be cleansed of all pagan altars and that the temple itself be rededicated to the worship of God. So this is going to be connected with, um, I think, the 25th of Kislev, if I'm not mistaken, this rededication of it. Now, mm-hmm. some people try to apply, you know, the 2300 days at, or 2300 evenings, mornings as a period of time. That's going to be uh, 1,150 days. Um, this other guy tries to apply the 1335. He's going to use... Um, an interesting a point that he notices is that if you go to the 24th day of the first month on the Enochian calendar, or the sometimes called the Jubilee calendar, uh, uh, because it has a 364-day uh, year with uh, four quarters of 91 days each, and that there's 1,335 days from the 24th day of the first month to the 25th day of the ninth month. And so from that coincidence, he then builds up this whole story about how the book of Daniel was written in the second century BC and they were using this calendar, which doesn't pan out. It doesn't make any sense. He's making lots of mistakes. Um, uh, and one is he's counting cardinally, which you would probably count those days ordinarily. But anyway, um, so... So anyway, that's the, the date of the 25th of Kislev in 164 that they're going to rededicate the temple. And that becomes connected with um, uh, Hanukkah, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so so it's Hanukkah. And that's why it ends up being around Christmas time because, you know, the the ninth and 10th months sort of are in that that area of December around the end of December. Right, so because as we know, twentieth day of the ninth month in uh, um, twenty 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 one is December twenty fifth, right? So the twentieth, so the twenty fifth day of the ninth month would have been, uh, you know, December thirty thirtieth or whatever. Does that make sense? Right. And uh, okay. Jesus goes to the feast. Of Hanukkah in uh, 30 BC. Yeah. In John 10. Yeah. Right. And that, uh, and it's called what the Festival of Lights or something as well. Right. Is that the idea? Because of the, the menorah, the eight branched menorah or something. Mm, yeah. Nine, I think. Nine. Is it nine? Yeah. I could never remember that. I should, I should know these things, but. Yeah, so in John chapter 10, yeah, they call it the Feast of Dedication, right? John 10, 22. And it, and it was at Jerusalem, the Feast of Dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in this temple in Solomon's porch. Okay, so it's going to be there uh, that he's going to say, but ye believe not because ye are not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice. I know them, they follow me. They give unto them eternal life, etc. And they're going to take up stones to stone him. <clears throat> One last thing I just said, 10.22. What's that? 10.22, that's interesting, October 22nd. So it kind of connects 164 BC to the, the end of the 2520. 
<laughs> or sort of the end of 2000, 2,300 days. Okay, explain that again. <clears throat> because it's the Feast of Hanukkah, so it's like one that's commemorating that 164 BC. Yeah. And you have a symbol for the end of 2,300 days as well. Being connected to that with that John 10 22, just just a re observation of them. Okay. The <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, so so it is interesting, um, interesting details that we start to notice as we look at this, right? Okay, um, okay, so I'm going to go back to this, I'll just read a bit more here. Okay, a few years later, after his defeat at the famous series of the famous Syrian general Nicanor, Nicanor, however you say his name, in the Battle of Adassa, 161 BC, Judas appealed to the rising Roman power for assistance in their struggle against Syrian oppression. He sent two of his closest friends, Jason and Eupolemius, to Rome as ambassadors to ask the Senate for both political and military aid to the Jewish nationalist movement in their struggle for political autonomy. As it turned out, the Roman Senate gladly offered its assistance to create a league of friendship with the Jewish nation. The famous Jewish historian Flavius Joseph quoted this specific decree as saying, the decree of the Senate concerning the League of Assistance and friendship with the nation of the Jews. It shall not be lawful for any that are subject to the Romans to make war with the nation of the Jews, nor to, nor to assist those that do so, either by sending them corn or ships, or money. And if any attack be made upon the Jews, the Romans shall assist them as far as they are able. And again, if any attack be made upon the Romans, the Jews shall assist them. Unfortunately, after achieving this league of friendship with Rome in 161 BC, Judas would never see the day of Jewish independence. He was eventually killed at Alassa later that same year, after presumptuously charging a superior Syrian force with only a small band of faithful supporters. Yet through the influence of Rome, Jewish independence would be achieved several years later under the leadership of his younger brother, Simon. They have here 141 BC, who as the high priest and head of all Jewish military forces established the Hasmonean dynasty. Yet even after Jewish freedom from Seleucid, Seleucid, or Seleucid, Seleucid, I never know how to pronounce that. Syrian oppression had been realized. Pagan Rome would use the Jewish League to its advantage by working deceitfully to become strong with a small people. As we have discussed earlier, the complete subjugation of the Jewish nation would eventually take place under the authority of Pompey. And uh, in 64, 63 B is that, BC is that issue. It's going to be the 63 BC that we mark, and Rome would use this alliance to further its own political interests, not just in Judea, but in the entire coastal region of the eastern Mediterranean area. As it turned out, by the year 30 BC, the main coastal regions of the east, namely Syria, Judea, and Egypt, were completely under Roman control. Now he's going to deal with verse 24 as well. So I'm going to read this here. Um, cause this is kind of where we're going to have to uh, really address more tomorrow, but we'll, we'll read this here. He shall enter peaceably even upon the fattest places of the province. This phrase continues to describe how pagan Rome through the Jewish league would enter peaceably upon the fattest places of the province. As stated above, pagan Rome would use this Jewish alliance to further its own political interests in the Eastern Mediterranean basin growing stronger over time to eventually assume control of the fast places of the province. That is the areas that would contain the most abundant wealth and natural resources. This would especially be true in the case of Egypt, as this region contained vast amounts of wealth. In fact, as we will discuss later, when Octavian, that's Caesar Augustus, finally confiscated the Ptolemic treasure at Alexandria after his defeat of Mark Anthony in 30, 31 BC, he would personally become wealthier than the entire Roman state itself. Therefore, the Jewish League, with all of its successive renewals over time, would be a sort of entering wedge for pagan Rome to eventually incorporate Syria, Judea, and Egypt into its empire. 
Josephus himself had claimed to sufficiently explain the friendship and confederacy that the Jewish nation at those times had with the Romans, uh, and referred to several instances where the Jewish League had been renewed periodically until the Eastern Mediterranean had been pacified by pagan Rome. In one such instance, Josephus noted that the high priest Hyrcanus, the son of Simon Maccabeus, Judas' brother, renewed this league with the Roman Senate in 129-128 BC. And that I've never noticed that one, that one before, because this is around the time that you get Judean independence. And also notice that this then is uh, 666 years uh, to 538, right? We already have that date marked, but more dealing with Judean independence. Hyrcanus, the high priest, was desir desirous to renew the League of Friendship they had with the Romans. And when the Senate had received their epistle, they made a League of Friendship with them. So that's going to be that one. Uh, in another example, Julius Caesar, who had a great deal of respect for the Jewish people after their support of him during the Alexandrian War in 48-47 BC, also decreed that the Roman Senate renew their alliance with the Jewish League. Josephus penned that it therefore pleased the Senate to make a league of friendship and goodwill with them, the Jews, and to bestow upon them whatsoever they stood in need of. Um, after Caesar's assassination in 44 BC, Josephus noted that his ally, Mark Antony, along with another consul named Publius Dolabella, um, would also confirm the Jewish League with another high priest named Hyrcanus, same person who had actually sided with Pompey in the struggle against his brother Aristobulus. Now, after um, Julius Caesar was slain, when Marcus Antonius, Mark Antony, and Publius Dolabella were consuls. They both assembled the Senate and introduced Hyrcanus's ambassadors into it and made a league of friendship with them. Again, this historical evidence offered by Josephus concerning the Jewish league with, Roman, with Rome demonstrates that Rome would enter peaceably into the fattest places of the province. In other words, Rome would use this particular alliance to explore the natural resources that the eastern provinces contained. And as a result of the conquest of Syria, Judea, and Egypt, vast amounts of wealth would flow into the pagan Roman treasury. Now, this is the part where Stephen and I started talking about dealing with the destruction of Jerusalem. And he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches. In this subpassage, Daniel states that pagan Roman Rome would eventually do what their fathers and fathers' fathers had not done, namely destroy Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD. Even when Pompey had pacified Jerusalem in 63 BC, he had not destroyed the temple itself, having left the temple treasury and its furniture untouched. Yet under the command of Titus Flavius Vespasianus, um, pagan Rome would do that which its fathers had not done, raising both Jerusalem and the temple to the ground. In fact, in Rome itself, the Ark of Titus depicts the specific victory, showing a depiction of the actual candlestick from the temple. The doom of both Jerusalem and the temple actually started four years earlier, when in AD 66, a major Jewish revolt arose against Roman authority in Judea. The Roman commander, Cestius Gallius, Gallus, responded by invading Judea to suppress the revolt and set himself to besiege Jerusalem after moving into an advantageous position to easily take the city, Cestius suddenly withdrew his armies for no apparent reason, retreating, retreating to the city of Antipatris. Ellen White noted that God had providentially directed this movement to give the Christians inside Jerusalem an opportunity to escape. The impending, the impending destruction. Sensing the chance to inflict a serious blow on the Roman army, Jewish soldiers attacked the retreating Roman troops inflicting heavy casualties, with Cestius himself having barely escaped. Disgusted at the performance of Cestius, the Roman emperor Lucius Germanicus Nero, which we call Nero, would then commission a veteran military commander named Titus Flavius Vespasianus, also called Vespasian, to replace Cestius. 
After reinvading Judea, Vespasian had also placed himself in a perfect position to overrun Jerusalem, as did Cestius. Yet after hearing that Nero had committed suicide, he would leave the region and turn over command to his son Titus, also called Flavius Vespasianus. So you can see these names can be confusing, especially for someone like me. After his father was eventually proclaimed the next emperor of Rome in AD 69, Titus would resume the siege of Jerusalem in the very next year in 70 AD. As it turned out, it would take Titus five months to penetrate the thick defensive walls that surrounded the city. So they're going to start this siege um, uh, like five, so it's going to be for five months. Now the siege is going to end in um, well, the, uh, the, uh, the siege begins just like two days before Passover. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so it's going to be, it's going to end in August and it's going to begin, um, in the spring there in connection with Passover, right? So two days before Passover. You're saying? Yeah, you're saying? That's something right now time, yeah. Okay. Um, with great difficulty, he would eventually overrun most of Jerusalem itself, with the exception of the temple fortification. As he planned an assault on this position, he gave specific orders that the temple was not to be harmed in any way. Yet at one point, a Jewish night attack provoked an armed response from his soldiers. While defending their position, a Roman soldier had accidentally thrown a flaming torch into the temple itself, and in a short amount of time, the entire structure was engulfed in flames. Despite a frantic effort to extinguish the fire, which included the personal effort of Titus himself, the temple would burn to the ground. As the Ark of Titus depicts, the Romans were able to save some of the precious vessels of the temple. Yet, Titus would eventually have the smoldering ruins of the temple, acreage, plowed to the ground. Later, he had observed Jerusalem lying in ruins. Titus told his Jewish captives that God had delivered their city into his hands. Overall, more than a million people were killed in siege, while another 100,000 were taken into captivity. Thus, with the complete destruction of the temple, the raising of the city of Jerusalem, and the dispersion of the Jewish people, Titus would do that which his fathers had not done, but his father's fathers, scattering among them the prey, the spoil, and the riches. Right. So, so this is kind of a, a, a point that we. So anyway, what do you think of that, Stephen? His his argument there. Yeah, that's, that's worth considering. Yeah, now, no, so part of it that, that I like, so why, why I think I, I like this, because it's taking this section and having it relate to the Jewish League itself and the results of that. Um, and also just these references to the prey, spray, the prey and the spoil and the scattering and the riches, which brings us back to Isaiah chapter eight. Right, dealing with uh, Maharshala Hashvaz. Right, so so that's why to me that this would refer to uh, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., just as it also does refer to the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, that's going to happen um, ultimately, progressively under the four seven times. Right, so so that's that's why I like it. It, it just seems to me to fit into this theme. And so it takes this, this verse is just addressing the result of the Jewish league. It, it's going to lead to the destruction of Jerusalem and the dispersion of the, God's people after the destruction of Jerusalem. And then it's going to go, um, you know, it, I mean, it's going to address the persecution of Christians as well. Right. So that's going to happen. He shall forecast his devices against the strongholds, um, even for a time. So this is going to go back and then say, well, from it's going to give us the end, 330. So it's going to then give us the starting point, which is going to be the battle of acting, right? So it, it's bringing us to the end of that. And then it goes back and, and starts at the beginning again. And so this becomes a consistent, um, way in which Daniel 11 is set out. We see that it, it it doesn't just chronologically move right from beginning to end, but it it takes 
groups of things, addresses them. Sometimes it prepares you for them, such as, you know, talking about Christ and then leading you to the crucifixion. And now here we have another one dealing with the Jewish League. So there's these little thematic groups of of ideas that are here. And and where we're going to have the challenge as we start to draw these lines out is we're going to see that we have lots of little lines. That, that this isn't just, I mean, there's obviously a bigger line of this whole whole issue. All of Daniel chapter 11, there's these, these bigger lines dealing with pagan Rome and papal Rome. But these fit into our understanding of the 2520s. So that's the other thing that we always have to consider here is that we have Daniel chapter 2, we have Daniel chapter 7, and we've gone through those. Um, uh, we have Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 9, and now we have, you know, 10 to 12, and here this Daniel 11 is fitting in details of, of that history, but it's doing it in a way uh, that's a repeat and enlarge. So when we start to make the application specifically to our time, uh, we're going to be, be able to see that these things apply within the movement because that's the application that we're making. The applications to our time specifically is an application to this movement. And, and we can see that because we have the Battle of Raphia, we have the Battle of Pidna, which are connected, you know, and I've known about those for a long time, you know, four or five years, uh, about the dates of them, and, and I've tried to figure out the significance. And I think, you know, what we talked about first dealing with 168 on the 1850 chart. And now we start to look at this, this history, we get more detail, right? So this detail is going to aid us. And so it, it just takes time, you know, so want people to be patient about this process. So, so I think those things are all very helpful, Stephen and Dwight and, and others. Um, any comments about any of this? I just made a comment in the chat. Oh, okay. So from the league to the destruction of Jerusalem is 230 years, a tenth of the 2300. Okay. So, um, and, and so what you're referring to is the league in 161, right? Yes. Okay, so you got 230 years, which is interesting. Okay. <clears throat> hmm. Well, it sure brings a lot of, a lot of things to think about. And, um, I'm going to try as, as much as I can, uh, to spend time studying this. I know I've, I've I had a busy weekend. Um, didn't do everything I wanted to do. So, but this, this is really, really helpful. So I'm going to have to keep, we're going to have to keep these things in mind as we continue to look at these things. Um, but I do like the destruction of Jerusalem being there, especially as you start to see it fitting into our lines. Right? Because we have that symbol. Uh, the tenth day of the fifth month, which which we mark in our line. So I'm just I'm just trying in my mind I'm just trying to think this through. So so the one thing that we talked about was this even for a time, and to see that that span of time, um, well, not necessarily 360 years, but either 360 days, which is a symbol that we get from the number 6256, six, right? Six times two times five times six is 360. And there is actually, it represents a period of 360 years. And um, we did look a little bit at some of these spans of time. Uh, but I think as we start to look at these things more closely, uh, we will we will find that the symbols will fall into place uh, with these Hebrew numbers. Um, so, so any any final thoughts? Is that I, I can't go anywhere else right now with this. There's just too many thoughts. But it, any way that we can sort of focus this a little bit, you know, what what we accomplished today.
Well, I have to think about it because you see, I put notes in the video of just what we talked about. So I'm going to try to to understand what it is that we actually discussed. Okay, let's close in prayer. <clears throat> Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for these studies and for, for, for the way that you guide and lead in these studies. Um, even when I neglect to do some of the work I should have done, um, we know, Lord, that you want to teach us. And um, we just ask, uh, that you can help us uh, to focus on our personal studies, not just in these topics, but in others, and um, that we can represent you and, and that we can present the truth to others. Forgive us for our sins and help us to trust fully in you. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.